first of all, um, I really like being here in Boston. Um, I'm, I'm from here, uh, and I, I lived here as of three years ago. Um, and so it's really cool to be back. And when like this meetup meet was announced, and like I saw all the people like chiming in on the on the attendee list, and I was like, I know him, friends with him, friends, friends. And I'm just like, this is so awesome because it's really just like the Boston deaf, deaf community is, is super cool and a lot of awesome people. And I, I wouldn't be like, I wouldn't love developing so much if it wasn't for like this local community that, um, that I really loved being a part of when I was here, and it's cool to have everyone here. So thanks. That's cool. <clears throat> All right, um, yeah, so uh, the mobile web is in deep trouble, is in, okay, deep, or just trouble. Um, <laughs> this, yeah, um, I've never given a talk before that's like this. Uh, I, I prefer giving talks where it's like demos and flashy shit and like a lot of fun and it's sort of like a knowledge bomb on your face. And, and this is not so much that, and so I hope <coughs> that's okay. But it's been something that I've been thinking about recently, and so I wanted to kind of share my perspective and share some of the conversations that I've been having with other people. Um, but it is sort of a downer. So if you get sad, I'm, I apologize in upfront for that. I'm gonna try and like make it up towards the end, and, like stop dance or something. I don't know. But it'll be okay. Um, what? I get a bicycle. Yeah, I could actually ride the unicycle, so like, if anyone has one of those handy... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. Um, All right, so this starts out with a story about my friend Charlotte. This is Charlotte, um, and then senior year of high school. She was actually a, a transfer student, or a foreign exchange student at my high school. And I was a freshman in high school at the time, but she was friends with my brother and his circle of friends, so we all kind of hung out. And she, She's a Kiwi, she's from New Zealand, uh, and super cool, super nice, and everyone was just like, Charlotte, it's the best, and we had a, like, just, she, I guess she was there for like nine months, and, and it was awesome. Um, and then, uh, we both grew up, and I guess we're like, what is that, something along 15 years later or something like that, um, and she works for this startup in New Zealand, well into New Zealand, called Zero, and they make accounting software, uh, it runs on the web, it's, a lot of people like this, it's small business accounting software, uh, it's really nice. And um, the cool thing is, so she works there, and their company, they kind of wanted to cultivate um, the developer community in New Zealand, and so they decided to put on a conference um, a little bit ago called WDC, uh, Web Developer Conference in New Zealand, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and Charlotte was organizing it. And so I get an email from her one day, and she's like, hey, Paul, how's it going? I haven't talked to you in like six years or so. Um, uh, so I'm organizing a conference for web developers, so you want to come and speak? And I was like, yeah, it's in New Zealand. Let's do this. Uh, and it was awesome. So I went there, and actually, uh, that's me and Charlotte at the conference. <laughs> and the book, it was super fun. Um, and then I got to travel with uh, Pamela Fox. Uh, her and I were on the same plane, we got to hang out, and then there was a weekend where there was like a spare day, and I was in New Zealand, I didn't really know what to do. Um, and she lived in Australia and knew kind of that region really well, and she, so Pamela was like, you should go to Rotorua. Has anyone been to Rotorua? I have. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Was it cool? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was. <laughs> so I was like, yes. That sounds good. So um, there's like all this um, kind of like geothermal activity, like natural wonders. But there's also a lot of like um, thrill seeking stuff. So that's why I went there. And so I went um, skydiving and I went bungee jumping. And on the same day as all that, I went zorbing, which is this amazing. Thing. You get this big inflatable thing thing and it has like warm water inside of it, which is good because it's kind of winter there. And then they roll you down this enormous hill and you're just inside like a hamster ball and it's nuts because you have no idea like which way is up or down and you're just like, like the challenge is that you just like run down the hill inside of it, but like within a heartbeat you are just like sloshing around on the inside and then you get out and you make an animated gift of these two pictures. <laughs> Yeah, so that's all well and good, um, and uh, and everything was fine up until about three weeks ago, when I read the news 
because zero, the company that Charlotte works for, the company that put that on, and I read this piece of news in the next web. Accounting software startup zero ditches HTML5 in favor of native iOS and Android apps, and I was just sad. <laughs> it was like, because they did so much, you know, at a conference, and like, I really felt like they were kind of an ally at all this, and why didn't they go and do something like that? <laughs> and then, and then, poor Charlotte, she didn't know. She messages me on Facebook like the day after. She's like, hey, I'm coming to San Francisco. You know, I want to hang out. And I was like, I'm kind of upset right now. <laughs> <laughs> My feelings are hurt, but I don't know how to respond to this. Um, so that, you know, that made me cranky. <laughs> Um, and I might not make you cranky because you don't have that kind of backstory, but let me try and give you some things that might make you a little bit cranky, uh, just so we can spread the crank out a little bit. <laughs> um, I've seen blog posts, this is not a notable person, and I don't, I don't believe, our apologies if you're here. Sorry. <laughs> 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 right. um, but anyways, fairly well written, and he says, go native. HTML5 is gonna lag um, for a while. It might catch up, but in the meantime, don't spend your time working on the platform. Uh, this was a downer, because I remember um, uh, opening up my phone and going to mobile Gmail, and then there was a tab to go over to Google Talk, and then I could just see my chat list right there, and I am back and forth inside the browser. And then at some point that disappeared, and I was like, why, and I look it up, and, and here's the response from Google. We're shutting down the mobile web app for Google Talk. Uh, we recommend using the native Google Talk app on Android. And I was sad. And I know that I work for Google. <laughs> I, I don't work on this team. <laughs> Clearly, I would have died to this. I mean, that's sad, right? <sighs> There's, uh, Belkin has super cool technology where you kind of like, you know, wired up home and you can flick light switches off electronically. And the cool thing is they have an app on your phone where you can just, you know, turn off your switches with your phone. Um, and so that's cool, but you, they have no web app to control this at all. It's only available for iOS and Android. So like, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, to be honest, like even just as a user, because I'm like on my laptop at home, I'm usually not on my phone at home, and like, but I have to pull out my phone in order to like unlock and turn off a light, even though I have a device right here. Anyways, it wasn't a priority for them to support the website. Uh, LIFX, this, these guys rent, rose a lot of money um, on, on Kickstarter, a lot, a lot of money. And it's all LEDs, you can get whatever color, it's all programmable, and there's apps to control it. And um, let me see. And I was like, I bet this is one of these freaking things that we don't <laughs> do the web. And so I, I asked him, like, Kickstarter, you can ask the person, and then your question will show up down here in the FAQ when they answer it. And so I said, this is my question. And I said, will there be a web interface? And he's like, down the track, we plan on adding a web interface, but our priority is building it for iOS and Android. And I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Some stats from Flurry Analytics. Um, uh, some people have expressed doubt about these analytics, but I've also seen a lot of other ones that are, are similar, so. <coughs> I have fairly good trust in me, so I'm just going to throw that out there as a hint of doubt. But anyways, you look at the trend line. So this is a 2010, 2011, not 2012 here. You consider the trend lines here. Web browsing on mobile, mobile native apps on mobile. Web browsing, native apps. It's not really the trend lines, right? And um, from Flurry, this was released just six days ago. Uh, taking the total time that's been spent on mobile devices, uh, all in the blue is native apps, and just that little bit is spent inside the browser. Facebook is down there at 18%, which is just barely under what's in the browser. 
Now, this doesn't capture web view time inside of native apps. So you can consider that. Facebook, the Facebook native app does use web views, um, just not for the timeline. That was what the big, their big announcement was, was that the timeline was going over to native. But they still use web views for a lot of it. Regardless, I think this paints a picture that on mobile, the browser and the web is having a hard time. And then you get tweets like this. Um, I don't, again, I want to say that this person's not notable. Um, maybe he is. But uh, the, the last favorite over on the right hand side, that's my, my colleague Ade. Um, uh, he works in, in London on, uh, for Google. And he, I guess he favorited this? I don't I have to have a talk with him, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> using web views in the is like screwing a wooden spoiler on the back of your sports car. Hashtag redneck tech. And now, uh, does, that make, does that make you sad? That's mm. white words. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think I think this matters. So this is so these are all stats about the mobile web. Um, here's the this was this came out yesterday. I think. Uh, this is the worldwide PC market sales of uh, PCs um, and the growth rate. This is the, the, the least amount of growth that PCs, laptops, and desktops have had in, uh, in 25 years or something. Um, this sentiment was also captured pretty well by um, a UK developer on the Debenham, uh, which indicates that the mobile web is now the web. The reality of people are consuming the web on mobile devices more than they are uh, desktop. I think Facebook had that, you might have heard a while ago, Facebook said that stat around um, more people use the, uh, the mobile Facebook site. They use that more than all their native apps combined. I heard that like a year ago or something. That's no longer true as of, I think, last October, um, where it's just been kind of like hockey stick growth. Um, and so they have considerable more traffic on the data side. Uh, all right, uh, this, I'm gonna take a drink. <laughs> a drink in honor of punctuation. This particular piece of punctuation has consumed a considerable amount of time <laughs> on behalf of all of us and the various discussions and we're up the out of it, that's the JavaScript developer. Um, yeah, it's just like, I mean, so, uh, a lot of people wrote about their feelings on semicolons, automatic semicolon insertion, uh, whether what's good style, etc. And it, it's, it got frustrating to me. Here's Christian Hellman, and he's like, he writes a post um, that is kind of criticizing people who are spending a lot of time uh, talking about how parsers treat semicolons. And so he's spending time criticizing how people are spending time on this argument. And I don't know, it didn't make sense to me, and I, I posted a reply to it, and I just said, native apps are eating our lunch, and we're here spending <coughs> hours arguing about syntax. And this is like, this is a lot of why I'm deciding to talk about this. It's just like, the charts that we saw before are painting a pretty serious picture, and it seems like a waste of time for some of the smartest people in the community to be having discussions around things that tools can manage for us. You know, like you have a style guide, you should have tooling that supports that for your team. It's important that your team agrees on what the style is, and you can have like Esprima can enforce the fact that you have uh, semicolons ending on all lines, and that you're not relying on ASI. It's solvable with code. It doesn't need to be a discussion. People can have their fashion preferences. It's fine. It doesn't need to be a topic of conversation, and I don't think it's a productive use of our time when we have other things that we could be doing. And so this was like a few months later I wrote this. And I said, I noticed there's a lot of people that are capable of driving change that don't feel any urgency. I feel like no one has made the case that the web platform needs ambition, execution, and speed to usher in compelling applications. Um, 
And how do you think we can explain to everyone that we're in a platform war and to keep prioritize our efforts? <coughs> and arguments about things like syntax may not come up at the top of that prioritization list. So that's kind of why I figured I'd say something. And again, it's like, I would much rather be talking about something very positive, um, but I, I feel like I can't on this topic. But the important thing here is that I, I, I didn't always realize this, because you know, I, I started, my first, when I started as a web designer, web developer, I made the website for my driving school. And it was pretty, it was pretty awesome stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I got to charge the guy. Um, oh, I told him that it would cost $100. And then when I finished, I was like so happy with it. I was like, actually, you know what? It's $325 now. <laughs> and, he's, and he was kind of upset, but um, $325 was actually the, the, the amount that it cost to take the driving lessons. So it felt like kind of like, like a good thing for both of us. But you know, I, I didn't always think that you know the web was like this platform. It was just like where web pages are, and and now I've kind of I've now absorbed this. It was like a few two years ago or something. So I've been working on the Chrome Developer Relations team for like three years, and a year into it, I was just like overwhelmed. I was I was like I don't I don't know if this is what burnout feels like. But I'm, I'm definitely feeling pressure, and I'm just like, there's a lot of information, and it's hard to prioritize. And I was just like, I need to cut something out. And, and, and I was like, just recognizing that I was trying to you know, be an advocate for an entire development platform. And I was like, that's actually really big. And then I was like, maybe I, so maybe I should cut something out. And I was like, mobile. I was like, what if I just didn't care about mobile anymore and just focus on the desktop side of the web? I was like, okay, yeah. Let's see. I would get rid of a lot of complexity for sure. So I'll do that. And so I did that for about like, okay, for like three week, three, three days. And then I was like, this is probably not gonna work. <laughs> um, but, but all that time I was like trying to do a lot to try and pull together all this information about our platform and like define the best ways to develop. And that's why I put a lot of time into things like, you know, defining, bringing all the defaults for each HTML5 boilerplate and the recommendations inside of HTML5 please and the techniques inside of Modernizer and trying to just pull this together so it's not so hard for anyone else to, to figure out all these pieces and, and how best to do them. Um, but the thing is that this is not just like our platform, but it's our platform. And this is the platform that, that we're kind of investing in. Has that always been? No. No. It changed when it sleep. That also sounds pretty good. Um, yeah, let's just do that. Shit, this kicks Hotmail's ass. But more importantly, like this was a 
this was a real legit web application. Um, and, and it's like still looking back at, at what it was then compared to it, the kinds of things that are being built now, it's still hugely impressive. <clears throat> and, and another way to look at this is that um, there's been application frameworks that have really targeted the whole like, let's deliver an application that is on par with the, the fidelity that you get from a desktop experience. Um, Cappuccino, Google Web Toolkit, and Sprout Core all kind of went for this. And they all came out from about like five years ago. Now the frustrating thing for me is that five years ago, I don't, I mean, there's probably a lot of factors that contribute to this, but they did not get very much um, adoption. And you look now at some of the things that we do inside the client-side MVC frameworks that we're doing, and it's, we're just kind of reinventing all the things that were present in like in the ecosystem years ago. I want to tell a little story about a guy named Andy. Is anyone in here named Andy? You get a prize or something. Um, <laughs> in that case, uh, Randy. This is Randy. Randy's really, Randy's super smart dude. He's, he's young too, he's annoyingly young. He's one of those like young developers that you're like, how old are you? And he tells you, you're just like, and you've done all that? And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> so annoying. Um, Randy's just a really smart software engineer. Uh, this is me and Randy uh, at a party. He's, he's turned to the side because he's actually hiding a beer bottle behind him. <laughs> he's not yet 21. <laughs> This is Majd, Majd Cavi over on the side. Um, I'm gonna get back to him in a second. Uh, Randy, this was three years ago, he became a commander on the Cappuccino project. Um, Cause he's legit. Cappuccino, uh, you wrote in Objective-J, which was kind of a port of the Cocoa development environment that compiled down into JavaScript. Um, so they invented a new language and web framework at the same time. Uh, it's pretty legit. Um, and he, was a fantastic developer in that, set, in that community for years ago when he was, don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and three weeks ago, he wrote this post. <laughs> Maybe, I think a number of you have read this. This was on the news and such. Uh, he wrote this post, I'm done with it now. And I actually, um, we were talking about it before he wrote it, and I kind of helped him out um, a good amount with kind of the framing of it and, um, and helped him spread it and share it, and, and hopefully people would read it. Because while it's like totally a downer, he's right about a lot of things. So one of the things that he says in here, um, he comes down and he's talking about um, a few years ago, a trend began towards micro.js. The idea being you use all these kind of tiny libraries, everything worked together, and that jQuery is too big. jQuery is not micro. And then we kind of, excuse me, we move forward, and it starts to talk about Ember, which is a popular topic of discussion these days. Um, Ember, for most people, would be considered whopping. I think that's a fair assumption at about 49k. Um, and he points out that 49k is is not a, is not a big amount of bugs. Um, that what he's criticizing here is that yeah that the, the the community kind of has addressed this whole JavaScript file size thing as kind of this 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 metric of goodness and this topic of well I need something smaller that's too big and jQuery is too large so yeah, let's use Zepto for instance and and it's a bad way to look at things like the uh, a good way to look at things I think. Um, if anyone could tell me what type of asset consumes most of the bytes on the web? Yeah. Um, so this is uh, this is from HBR archive, kind of uh, aggregate stats over I think, top one thousand websites. Images consume fifty nine point six two repeating uh, percent of the web. Um, whereas JavaScript, the little the yeah. pie at the top, not so big. Um, a good way to think about things is that 
the difference between Zepto and jQuery is about a third of an image. So, yeah. What about a red image? What about a red image? Yeah, red images are bigger, and these days we want to do like the double size and then, do, and then put like huge ass JPEG compression on it because that's, so that's actually legit. I think that's, that's um, But the thing is, like, I'll, I've long maintained that like that you cannot argue about JavaScript file size if you do not have a build step that compresses your images. Um, I think that's probably a good way to look at things. Um, the other thing that he points out, that Randy points out in this post, is along the lines of ramp up on new technologies. It comes down and quotes <coughs> quotes someone on Hacker News. Um, not, not to pick out Hacker News or anything. I mean, most of the comments on there are pretty legit. Um, <laughs> And he says, uh, so, so someone says, they're, they're referring to Ember. It's going to take me at least a day or two before I begin to understand how long it's going to take the rest of my team. And so I'm like empathetic to like, to that perspective, and then I'm empathetic to, to Randy's perspective. Like, first of all, like, ramping up on new technology sucks. But Randy takes the perspective of, listen, like, this is our job, this is our career. Like, Think about how long you use the tools and libraries that you've adopted. It, it's weeks and months and likely years. So an investment of one or two days to ramp up on that technology is probably worth it to give you back the dividends that you're going to get in productivity of using that in your career. So since I just said the word years, um, I wanted to take a moment about this. <laughs> ben, ben Allman was here earlier, and I, I gave him a hug when I told him I was going to do this slide. Ben, I, I've known Ben Allman like, in real life for, for like five years. Uh, he came over, uh, he came over, I was with Nick Cooley, I was working with Nick at Molecular um, in Watertown. And Ben works in Watertown, or lives in Watertown, and he came over to, to the company, and we, we rewrote, or we basically, developed Modernizer 1.0 together as a refactor of the original version. Um, and we've known each other for forever. And I, I really only just realized this recently, which is like, the people that like, you know from kind of the, the industry, the community, the people that I know from five years ago are still doing the same thing. I'm still friends with them, that's cool, right? And I expect that I'm, we're all still gonna be friends in five years from now. And that's kind of freaky in a way, like I guess the difference is that <coughs> Uh, we'll be friends, but we'll just have like kids, I guess, because we'll be adults and grown-ups. But that's cool too. Um, so I think it's important to like cultivate your relationships. And like I was saying earlier, like the Boston developer community for me was really just like inspirational. Um, I not only had like peers but mentors and uh, kind of like a healthy amount of competition where we all learn from each other. And I think that's really important. Finding like someone that you Become friends with today is going to be a great friend in a year, and it's going to be a very valuable connection for you to have. <clears throat> so, I mentioned before that guy Madge, who was in the picture with me and Randy. This is Randy posting his, putting up his <coughs> post on Facebook, and uh, puts it on here. And then down here in the comments are two comments. This is Madge. Um, and he's like, I'm done with the web. You need both, buddy. Life has never been better. Come on. Madge worked on um, Sprout Core uh, for like three years. He's, he comes from a web development background. And Thomas Alot, who's also known as Subtle, Subtle Gradient, um, he is from the, the Mutuals community from about 2005. He's been blogging about web development forever. Um, really smart dude. He's, he's been at Facebook for a while now. But, and he also kind of joins in and welcome to the club. And I just like read this and I was like, you know, I agree with the Randy things, like, I think it's important, and then, like, these ex-web developers are just, like, so happy to be done with that. Um, mm, sad. Okay. So, I think what I'm trying to say here is that, I mean, this might be, a, like, a, this is, part of a, a long-term perspective, right? That we have careers and, and jobs and we're focused on, on what we do as developers. And I think it's important that we're investing in that platform. Um, Alex Sexton said this 
uh, or, you know, he's on the modernizing team as well as general JavaScript genius. If your job is developing a web platform, I feel like it's only natural to help invest in making it better instead of hacking around it. And I agree. I, I, think, I think in reality, it's a combination of investing in making it better and hacking around it because I kind of have to do that. But it's important to invest in it. And, and I think there is kind of like this a little bit of bystander effect, the Kitty Genovese effect, where like, there's a lot of us, right? And so you just assume that there's that problem in that browser. I'm sure that someone filed it. There's that feature that is so obvious. Why don't they just put that in? I'm sure someone asked that team to do it. And I think because we're so big, we just assume it's happened. And in many cases, it hasn't. There's not a lot of people at the um, kind of driving things forward. This is Adam Brewell. He um, runs the Keep It Real Time conference in Portland, Oregon. Um, kind of a web socket over to see all that stuff. Really good stuff. Um, he said this in his book. <coughs> Nothing can stop you from making things better than they are right now. I think we as developers, we feel kind of like we're privileged and, and we feel empowered because we can sculpt things out of nothing. And we, we, when we find a problem, we always shoot to find that solution. And, and whatever problems we have, we can make them better. This is Alex Russell. Alex um, uh, created the Dojo library. Um, then he went to Google, Google a while ago. One of his first things that he did there was rewrote the DOM of Gmail, making it about 20% faster. And he did that just like for fun. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then he went and created a Google Chrome frame, um, which is a pretty badass thing. And um, him and I were having lunch like a year ago, and we were talking about browsers and kind of just the general ecosystem. And um, we were talking about like things that should happen. You know, someone should do this. And, and he says to me something along the lines of, if you want to see a change happen, you should do it. <laughs> like, there's not like people out there that are just waiting for you to spout out suggestions on what should happen. Um, it's important that you, you see your idea and you follow up on it. And you either do it yourself or you find people to help you or you support the person that is behind that, that change. I think part of this is kind of the, the Wikipedia policy. So this is their own community policy. But be bold. Like, go out there. Take the initiative. Be confident. Just get in there and start supporting. From an like, open source perspective, I can tell you that for all the projects that I've been on, uh, like GitHub open source projects, like, the person that comes into a project goes into the issue tracker and just starts to figure out how to close bugs, triage bugs, issue pull requests, give the people feedback who provided pull requests. Like, you are beloved by the maintainers. Like, that is, some people think that it's not their place to do that. No, please do that on basically every project. Um, as long as you know what you're doing, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but feel free to be confident about doing that. So, I laid out kind of a lot of the reasons why mobile, native mobile has a lot of momentum. And some of the challenges that are faced against the mobile web. I think there's a few. Uh, this capability one, this was a, oh, I'm just gonna read it out loud, because we, uh, uh, the full Safari engine is inside of the iPhone, and so you can write amazing Web 2.0 and Ajax apps that look exactly and behave exactly like apps on the iPhone. And these apps can integrate perfectly with iPhone services. They can make a call, they can send an email, they can look up a location on Google Maps, and guess what? There's no SDK that you need. You got everything you need if you know how to write apps using the most modern web standards to write amazing apps for the iPhone today. Awesome. Who said that? Steve Jobs. Yes. Steve Jobs. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. I mean, it was, Steve Jobs was behind writing mobile web apps for the iPhone. And I don't think he, you know, if he thought that uh, mobile <coughs> web apps would be bad for the iPhone users, I don't think he would have been saying this. <coughs> the ambition is another part of this that I think is, is pretty important. And it's, it's a little kind of, uh, it, it, it has a lot of stakeholders. Um, 
This is another quote from that post by Randy, I've done with the web. Francisco Tomalski, who created um, Objective J and created Cappuccino, um, he wrote, uh, well, that um, his startup that created all that, created this application called 280 Slides with um, Cappuccino. Um, this is a desktop fidelity application for building a slide deck. Um, this was released five years ago. It is, it's a fantastic application. Um, it's really, really well done, like smooth animations, really just beautiful. And he says that this was 18 months ago when he said this, um, so it's kind of like a dated quote. Had we released 280 slides today, in 2011, it would generate as much excitement and be considered just as innovative when it was released three and a half years ago. And he goes on to say that that makes him sad. And I mean, it makes me sad. You know, there's, I think part of this is, is that there's not a lot of people that are kind of shooting for that fantastic experience. And I think part of this is not, like this is not just up to developers to do. This is kind of for everyone to participate in. Um, and I think we can all deliver a much better user experience than we do, to, do today on mobile and desktop. I think it's important that we all ask the designers that we work with to challenge us. We want, like, we want to have good challenges in the UI. We want to deliver fantastic features. Um, and we want challenges. So ask them to challenge them. Offline is another, um, <coughs> another challenge that gets brought up oftentimes. Um, because I don't think of, you know, users probably don't expect the web to work. When they open, they're like in a tunnel or on a plane, they open up the phone. They don't expect <coughs> things to work when they open up a browser on their phone, or they type in a URL, they don't expect it to work. But in a lot of cases, it does work, as long as there's an application <coughs> on the inside. But there's like this cognitive dissonance between what does work and what people expect. I think there's ways to solve this, but I think the, the users don't feel like the bytes are theirs. With a native application, you, you, you want a piece of information, so you're like, okay, I'll go get the native app. So you keep in mind that piece of information that you want, and you go over to the, the app store, and then you download that, that native app, like nine megabytes of it, and then that finishes, download it and install it, and then you open it, and then you'll find that piece of information that you want. <coughs> cool. On a web, you're just like, you search for it, you find it, you get to it. But I think that experience of like downloading makes people feel like, like it's mine. And so now I can trust this thing that I had to wait for because it's, it's there, right? Right? But like, a lot of, a lot of native apps don't. Like um, Mint, Mint.com, I have the, the app on my phone. I open that, when I'm not connected, it just crashes. Like, a lot of native apps just have no support in the world for being offline. And I think that's kind of a misperception. Um, and a lot of web apps do work offline. Um, and I, I mentioned before, Facebook, the, the Facebook app uses plenty of web views. Um, it's not, not the timeline, that's a big deal. Um, there's another app that is that recently came out that everyone was like, wow, fantastic work, it must be all native. Um, web view. Good. <laughs> login is another one. Nick, uh, Nicole Sullivan has brought this up a lot. But the login experience on native mobile is basically I unlock my phone. Um, if it's the first time I'm running my app, I have to log in. But other than that, I never log back into an application. On the mobile web and the desktop web, you log in a lot. The same things over and over again. But like, take for instance, like. If you did not want someone to access two of your most prized web apps because they had most of your personal information, it'd probably be like your email, maybe like your private or social network, something like that. And how long is kind of the login cookie set for Gmail and Facebook? It's a long, long time. Anytime. You are not you are not logging in your on that. I think it's important to think about kind of not setting up these barriers between you and your users. But, but being scrupulous with that experience of user wants to come back to my, my application, I'm back in. Performance is another one that comes up a lot when it comes to uh, web versus native. Um, and I think that we all kind of are aware of it, 
And to be honest, there's a lot of techniques, a lot of tools, and we're, we're not yet really taking it too seriously. Um, there's discussion around it, but we're not talking about the techniques um, and being pragmatic about what to do. So I encourage everyone to you know, give a talk on performance, um, your local meetup group, conferences, whatever. Find out, <clears throat> like look into profiling. Um, and this is, this is another part of it, which is that there's, it's easy to kind of be caught up with all of the recommendations, especially with web performance. You know, network side of web performance, there's a lot of things you got to keep track of. Uh, there's the basics of gzip and concat and minify and all that, but then it gets into domain charting and all this shit. Um, it's important to embrace tools. So, for instance, with all those recommendations, you can install mod page speed and basically take care of all the things that page speed and YSL recommend to you. All of them, just mod page speed. It just sits on your patchy and does it all for you. Um, so rely on tools, use profilers to find out what your bottlenecks are, not some JS <coughs> test that is online and you're like, oh, see, it's faster. <laughs> sure, you can switch to it, but it might not make any serious dent because your, your actual problem is in paint or it's in layout or in recalc style and not actually JavaScript execution. Cool. So I wanted to try and put like some call to action because I don't want to be a jerk for this entire talk. Mm -hmm. Positive. And this is where I'm going to dance. It's like <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, about a year ago, me and some friends put together this site called Move Door Forward. Um, and, and it still has, has really sharp recommendations. It's kind of split up into three areas depending on kind of the uh, experience of the person. Um, Let's say down here, uh, there's a lot of recommendations on how you can really invest in the platform. Um, reducing test cases for Mozilla. Um, contributing to the Chrome DevTools. Uh, contributing to Firefox, WebKit, Link. Contributing to test suites. This is something that uh, we've seen uh, since Mozilla Web Forward launched. The, the test of the Web Forward movement has kind of taken this and, and kind of crowdsourced contributions to W3C test suites, which is a fantastic thing. Um, W3C test suites are kind of one of the very few chances for browsers to run the exact same tests. All browsers have their own tests, like um, Safari and Chrome and Firefox um, and IE have their own tests. But to be honest, there's not a heck of a lot of tests that all of them run, which is why there are some you know, inconsistencies around how browsers implement things. Now, these are fixed. There's way more tests now than there were a few years ago. But there's still a lot we can do there. Um, these are uh, a number of people who are just doing God's work for the web platform. Um, all these people are very invested, um, but more importantly, they represent the web developer perspective um, in standards bodies um, and two browsers. Uh, Toby Langell is the AC rep for the W3C for Facebook. But and he's kind of been doing things for Facebook and kind of doing web standard stuff for a while, but just recently he decided to take a year off of Facebook. They're going to pay him to, to just spend a year contributing to the W3C test suite effort, which is just like addressing cross browser testing. It's fantastic. Uh, Marcos, Yehuda, and Alex also got elected to the W3C uh, technical architecture group. It's kind of like sets, it's kind of a meta group, but it sets directions for what's important for uh, the standards groups to be considering and not considering. Um, and they're really advocating for what is important to developers. Like a good example of this is JSON, not XML. Um, Rick Waldron from Moku is fantastic. He is taking notes and communicating a lot of the discussions that are happening from TC39, the group that's standardizing JavaScript, and sharing it with all of us, which is giving, <coughs> he's also participating there and advocating for what's important um, for developers in the next version of JavaScript, so it's not just designed by a bunch of academics. The rest of these guys, Network Key from Boston, um, has done fantastic work on responsive images and standardization of that stuff. Um, they're all great people. So find these people, ask them if you can help out, because they can be more helpful. <coughs> Filing bugs is really important. Um, but one important thing to say here is that browser developers do not hang out on Twitter like 
looking for people that are bitching about bugs. <laughs> um, I also like the other important part is that not a lot of people who develop browsers come from a web development background, and they don't really know a lot of the pain points that they have, um, and that's something that you know we're trying to address. But it's important that when you find inconsistencies, especially with like newer features, you go through the process of reducing the problem, seeing it. Seeing if you can reproduce on the versions and finding the ticket. Um, go through that work because we want to see it fixed. And if you don't report it, there's a, you need a good chance that no one else will. <clears throat> but I will point out that all browsers are really, really value having a compatible web. And this is something that we touched on. Um, I think most of you have heard that uh, Chrome uh, launched a new rendering engine called Blink. Um, last week or so. And so this is uh, in the developer FAQ for Blink. Um, um, well, there's a question about what's stopping Chrome from shipping proprietary features. And um, uh, we mentioned here that our goal is to drive innovation and improve the compatible open web platform. And this is important to all browsers. Browsers know that that the power of the web platform is really dependent on the capabilities of all browsers that are running it and the interoperability of all those browsers. And so having bugs that are only that are affecting one of those browsers affects the entire platform. So interop is important. There's one of the things that I've kind of noticed by going from a guy making a driving school website to working at Google and getting to like talk to a bunch of extremely smart people um, is that you identify all the people that are involved in kind of web standards and, web and, and browser development. And they're all just people. And there's not a heck of a lot of them, especially inside web standards. Um, there's a core of people that really drive things forward. Um, and having just even like 10, you know, five people in that area writing specifications and authoring test suites would have a dramatic, dramatic effect on the pace of innovation and the consistency of the web platform. <sighs> Randy, again, in the blog post, I was talking about him, he was like, positive. Maybe, maybe that the way that we think about the web platform would be a bit different. And instead of using a term like web developer, we thought software engineering. So, <clears throat> Positive things. <laughs> it's talk. It's um, good things. Well, this is so. I was. I, I gave this talk in Orlando uh, two days ago, and someone came up to me afterwards and was like, "You know, that hype thing. He's like, are we just in the trough of the movement?" And I was like, "I am." <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we are, but I am. I think part of this, like. Uh, I was thinking about Flash and Flex, and I got I got really bummed out. I got bummed out when it was happening because Flash and Flex got demonized really quickly, and it just must have like I don't cover that background, but it must have sucked for all those folks because like you are an experienced developer, and all of a sudden like the, the technologies that you're proficient in are just like a bad thing, and it just must. Have, what? Yeah, they can attest to that. Um, and it just totally sucks. And, and the other important thing is that, you know, those development platforms have a lot of great decisions and a lot of structure in them. And I've seen like Flex developers come over into the HTML5 land and kind of go, how do we, I gotta pull that library here and this one over here, and then I just kind of, and so, I think we might have gone a little bit high on kind of our excitement. Um, and there's nothing to do about that. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm yeah, looking forward to this part. <laughs> and let you know. um, some good things. jQuery. jQuery team has been doing awesome things recently. Um, they've been, John Rezek a while ago said, he's like, I started jQuery because I hated dealing with browser bugs. I uh, just wanted to, you know, skip over that. But the problem is that jQuery has become 
the funnel by which everyone's browser bugs comes into. Um, and so jQuery ended up dealing with more browser bugs than anyone else, which is an unfortunate fact for John, but uh, that's how it worked out. Um, but they've done a fantastic job of upstreaming all those bugs uh, and telling you know, Firefox, Mozilla, I'm oh, sorry, Mozilla, Chrome, IE, Apple, everyone about bugs and getting them fixes. Um, there's a fantastic idea that a lot of the folks in the jQuery team are batting around called Quirks Bench. This is an idea around bench, a benchmark that basically takes all the code paths inside jQuery that do like a feature detect and have to work around some kind of quirk that's in there um, and basically create one benchmark that just has all these switches and every time it has to go around because of a problem, you get doctor point, which seems awesome. Um, <laughs> I was talking to uh, Darren Fisher, he's the, the engineering lead of the web platform on the Chrome team. Super smart guy, been developing browsers for like 10 years or some shit, it's crazy. Um, he, and he said to me, he's like, if web developers make benchmarks, we'll make them fast. I think that's a really like empowering thing to think about, that you make a benchmark, the browsers will compete on, on doing really well in that benchmark. So I'm really excited about what this is gonna do. Um, jQuery's also been removing cruft uh, and suggesting what we could do to improve things. They just recently uh, suggested uh, on Chrome to remove window.event from the DOM, uh, which is in there for very like, legacy reasons to go with some compatibility path, i.e. from forever ago. Um, and Scott Gonzalez and Dave Bethel recorded it, and um, on the Chrome team they're like, yeah, that's good. So, I mean, deprecating things is, is not always easy, but we're gonna find a nice way to do it. Jigger is also about evolving kind of the way that we look at browser support. I think that the way that they tackled browser support with jQuery 2.0 is, is a really progressive way to look at things. Uh, I want to call out this site, um, which is pretty rad. This is a basically it's a visualization of can I use dot com um, data. So let's say that I want to do something like um, I want to use CSS3 transitions. And I also want to use um, just a good one. No. Uh, okay. Up to I do want to have transforms. Sure. Okay, yeah. So this is pretty cool. So you can basically select like the features that you're interested in and get an idea of how many mobile users can support that. Uh, with transitions and transforms. 86% of people on mobile, so this is using stack counter or browser share data um, against what can support it. That's pretty good view. You can take an take a aggressive stance on what you're doing in the mobile <coughs> Another positive thing, this came out like two days ago. Um, this was um, Matt Say from Readwhite, uh, was at like the summit with a bunch of CIOs, and um, let's see, he said, this was awesome. He says, I spent the afternoon in New York City. Hey, it's hot pink. I pulled a group on mobile applications. Every single executive, not one exception, was building hybrid HTML5 apps. Meaning the bulk of the app is going to HTML5 and the native wrapper. Every single one. So that's pretty awesome. It's got a lot of support. <clears throat> Mobile browsers are moving really fast. Uh, this is fantastic. Chrome on Android um, is uh, now shipping every six weeks. Uh, this is like as of two weeks ago or something. So a new version comes to everyone and it you know, keeps everyone up to date as well. So we're doing the same thing. Cordova, which is a parent project of OMGAP, is really moving ahead fast and, and um, narrowing the gap between the capabilities that Native has and what's available to be what new. Um, so it has a lot of full-time engineers from both Apple and the Chrome team contributing <coughs> to that. It was, uh, it's fantastic to learn. This is a, a, a cool kind of development. Um, <clears throat> you watch kind of the Promises space um, and async handling. Um, there's been a spec that's been developed called Promises A and now turned into Promises A+. Plus. It's been kind of developed by the JavaScript community on the best way to handle Promises. Uh, this was baked into the DOM futures spec that Alex Russell um, has created to propose futures into the DOM. 
Um, and that future spec is now uh, in the OpenG uh, DOM specification. So it's really pretty awesome to see something that kind of started um, as a specification that was written by the JavaScript community um, translating it into something that is now in the DOM specification. So, <clears throat> this is a list of the web advantages. I'm cribbing this from um, Christian Kalman. But some of the things that are kind of unique to the web platform that I think it's important to remember. You can write once and deploy it on a huge number of devices. Um, I saw there's a, there's a Wi-Fi enabled fridge. Um, which one's <laughs> the shareability of links cannot be undervalued. Um, the fact that you can take a link and send it to a friend kicks the ass of native mobile applications <laughs> where you have to go through a chooser and figure out how to share this state. It never makes any sense. Uh, I think that's really important to remind ourselves of that and build experiences that take advantage of that. Like, um, I've seen some new kind of experiences Oh, there's a new um, site called conversat.io. It, it uses WebRTC. You can just go to conversat.io slash JavaScript Boston, and <coughs> it is just a video chat room powered by WebRTC, peer-to-peer -peer video. It just works, and you just share that URL. There's no kind of like login and invite procedures. It's just straight up URL. It's fantastic. <coughs> Web's also built on multi-vendor standards, which means there's longevity on it, and you can trust it. So many developers, the developer base is huge. And the other cool part about it, I think especially for the front end of the web, is that I think this is because of resource. source. But like we take a very, it's a very open community where we're all about kind of sharing knowledge with each other. And I think that that is a fantastic thing. And you don't see that in very many other communities. The consumption uh, tool and the development tool are the same thing. It's just a lot of power. You can send out updates. <sighs> As far as your application, without shooting down the entire thing again, all updating nine megs again for uh, the user, and it can adapt to the environment with, on whatever device it's on. So I think it's important to think these things, especially when it comes to kind of the idea of competing with native, because it's troublesome to kind of do the things that it that native apps do, and so and defer to a hockey player. To really say something inspirational. Because it's legit. Some people skate to the puck, I skate to where the puck is going to be. And I think it's important to think about that and think about what kind of experiences we want to build on the mobile web. <coughs> Not just chase the tail of native mobile, but take advantage of the web's advantages to create lasting experiences. <coughs> so, anyways, the mobile web, I think, can reach its potential, but we have some work to do and it'll take to do effort. Thank you.